verses 1 through 16. Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 1 through 16. Jeremiah chapter 33. And verses 1 through 16, with a special emphasis on verse 3. We've been going through a sermon series on what the Word of God has to say about prayer. And I believe in Jeremiah chapter 36, 33 and verses 1 through 16, we have one of the most powerful texts on prayer that is contained in the Word of God. And here is what, here's what we're going to see as we look at this text this morning. It's this, through prayer, God wants to show you great and mighty things through prayer. Remember this. God wants to show you, wants to teach you, wants to do in your life great and mighty things. And the point is this. These great and mighty things can only achieve through prayer. God won't work them out by any other means but prayer. Let's go before God and pray. Right now. Yeah. Heavenly Father, yes. we need you to speak to us now. Yeah. Because there's so much turmoil in this world. So much turmoil in our own personal lives. Things going on on our jobs, where we live, with people we know. So many distractions, Lord, or things that could be distractions. Mm -hmm. Help us, Lord, to put them all aside right now. We ask that you would quiet our hearts right now. And that, Lord, you would show us some of those great and mighty things, even now, oh God, that you would do in our lives this morning, great and mighty things, and burn in our hearts the importance of seeking you in prayer, because it's only by prayer that great and mighty things that can be uh, can be accomplished, Lord, as we seek you. Help us now, O oh God. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us read beginning in the first verse. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the second time, while he was still confined in the court of the God, saying, Thus says the Lord, who made the earth, the Lord, who formed it to establish it. The Lord is his name. Call to me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. Thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the houses of this city and concerning the houses of the kings of Judah which are broken down to make a defense against the siege ramps and against the sword while they are coming to fight with the Chaldeans and to fill them with the corpses of men whom I have slain in my anger and in my wrath. And I have hidden my face from this city because of all their wickedness. Behold, I will bring to it health and healing, and I will heal them, and I will reveal to them an abundance of peace 
and truth. I will restore the fortunes of Judah and the fortunes of Israel and will rebuild them as they were at first. I will cleanse them from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities by which they have sinned against me and by which they have transgressed against me. It will be to me a name of joy, praise, and glory before all the nations of the earth which will hear of all the good that I do for them. And they will fear and tremble because of all the good and all the peace that I make for it. Thus says the Lord God, Yet again there will be heard in this place of which you say it is a waste, without man and without beast, that is, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without men and without inhabitant and without beast, the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of, of those who say, Give thanks to the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And of those who bring a thank offering into the house of the Lord, for I will restore the fortunes of the land as they were at the first, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, there will be again in this place which is waste, without man or beast, and in all its cities, a habitation of shepherds who rest their flocks, in the cities of the hill country, in the cities of the lowland, in the cities of the Negev, in the land of Benjamin, in the environs of Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah, the flocks will again pass under the hands of the one who numbers them, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth, and he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell in safety. And this is the name by which she shall be called. The Lord is our righteousness. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word for his name's sake. Folks, I am convinced that each and every one of us here, as we trust the Lord Jesus Christ, and as we walk in obedience to Him, and as we seek Him in prayer, He wants to show us great and mighty things. He wants to do great things in your life and in my life. He wants to do powerful things in your life and in my life, not only on an individual basis, although let's tarry there for a moment, I'll tell you, he wants to do great and mighty things in your life on an individual basis. So you know what that means? He wants you to have the job that you need. He wants you to have the money that you need. He wants you to have the apartment or the house that you need. Whatever needs that you have that you can identify this morning, He wants you. He wants to do great and mighty things in your life for you to have those things. I'm not talking about 
wants or things that you just desire but don't really need. I'm talking about things that you need. God, I know, wants to do them in your life. Not only does He want to do them individually, He wants to do them corporately in this church. I am convinced that God wants to build up this church in one day. Mark my words, it is going to be filled to overflowing in this sanctuary. One day it's going to be so filled up that some of you are going to come up to me and say, Brother Ray, when well, we're going to stop looking for a new building. God wants to do a great and mighty work both individually and corporately. I am convinced that in the bridge which begins tonight, God is going to do great and mighty things, awesome and powerful things. You're going to see folks saved there. You're going to see backsliders returning to the Lord. You're going to see folks being restored. You're going to see broken lives being put back together again. You're going to see broken families reunited. You're going to see husbands that have been separated from wives coming back to their wives in repentance. You're going to see wives that have been separated from their husbands coming back to their husbands in repentance. You're going to see wayward children turning back to their fathers and turning back to their mothers. God is going to do great and mighty things through the bridge Sunday through Wednesday this week. But you see, here's the thing. All of those great and mighty things only come as we, the people of God, seek Him in prayer. And that's the point that's going to be emphasized to us this morning. Let me give you a little bit of background information as to what's happening here in this passage. The nations of Israel and, and Judah, the two Jewish nations that had existed at that time, had turned away from the Lord. They walked away from their God, and they were living in wickedness. They were living in rebellion against God. And so as a judgment, the Lord brought the army of the king of Babylon down to bear upon them. And as this passage was taking place, which we just read, the Babylonian army was laying siege to the city of Jerusalem. King Zedekiah was the king of Judah at that time. And he reigned in Jerusalem. And Jeremiah was prophesying to King Zedekiah that the Babylonian army was going to lay waste to the city. King Zedekiah, you would hope, you would wish that upon hearing that, that Zedekiah would lead his people in repentance to the Lord. That maybe he would be leading his people in crying out unto God for forgiveness and mercy. That he would be leading his people as a king was supposed to lead his people in returning to the Lord and leading them in righteousness. But according to the 32nd chapter of Jeremiah, Zedekiah doesn't do that. But you know what he does instead? He locks up the messenger. He has Jeremiah thrown into prison. So in verse 1, when we read here, listen to this. When we read here that Jeremiah was confined in the court of the guard, that's kind of like a nice way of saying that he's in the moose cow. <laughs> you know, he's, he's in the big house right now. Hmm. 
He's in the penitentiary. Locked up. That's how wicked King Zedekiah had become. Rather than repenting, he'd rather lock up the message. You know, someday we ought to do a study on all the inmates and convicts and criminals in the Bible. You know that there are quite a few of them. Moses killed the man. Remember that? David killed the man. Joseph spent time in prison. The apostle Peter was locked up in prison. The apostle Paul was locked up in prison. Daniel was thrown down into the lion's den. Remember that? And here's Jeremiah. And he's locked up too. But look at this. And here's a word of encouragement for us today. You would think the guy would get discouraged, right? Being locked up, probably in some dark dungeon type of prison cell. See, he's still carrying on and doing the work of the Lord. Turn back to the 32nd chapter. I want to show you what Jeremiah was doing while he was locked up in the prison cell. Jeremiah chapter 32. Listen to this. This is as he's incarcerated. Hook down beginning at the 16th verse. After I had given the deed of purchase to Baruch the son of Neriah, hear this. Then I prayed. You see that? Well, he was locked up. Bars in front of him. Couldn't move. Couldn't go anywhere. He says, then I prayed to the Lord, saying, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Look at this now. Nothing is too difficult for you. Did you hear that, folks? No matter what problem you got going on in your life, no matter what the situation is, no matter how dark and dismal and depressing it may seem, it says here in the 17th verse, Jeremiah calling out to God, acknowledging to him, nothing is too difficult for you who shows loving kindness to thousands but repays the iniquity of fathers into the bosom of their children after them. O oh, great and mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name, great in counsel and mighty indeed, whose eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, giving to everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds who has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. Remember when he delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, how he did that with great power and great might, how he brought the ten plagues down to bear upon the nation of Egypt, and how the children of Israel were able to escape. And you will recall when they got up to the, to the Red Sea, and they were facing the Red Sea in front of them, and Pharaoh's army behind them, and they thought that Pharaoh's army would destroy them on the banks of the Red Sea. But God spoke through Moses and told Moses, stretch forth your hand. And when Moses stretched forth his hand, the Red Sea parted, and the children of Israel were able to cross on dry ground. But when Pharaoh's army tried to pursue them, the Bible describes how the walls of water came crashing down on Pharaoh's army, and every one of them to the last man was drowned. What Jeremiah is doing here in his prayer is he's 
praying back to God and saying, God, I remember how you delivered in the past, and I know that you can deliver now, and I know that you can deliver in the future. You see, there's always hope for you, no matter what you're going through. The same God that delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt is still in the delivering business today. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah says, and even to this day, even to this day, you can say it yourself right now, even to this day, March 9th, 2014, God is still saving folk and still delivering folk and still healing folk and still re restoring folk and still bringing families back together, mm -hmm. even to this day. Both in Israel and among mankind, mm -hmm. you have made a name for yourself as at this day. Mm -hmm. You brought your people, Israel, out of the land of Egypt with signs and with wonders and with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm and with great terror and gave them this land which you swore to their forefathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. They came in and took possession of it, but they did not obey your voice or walk in your law. They have done nothing of all that you commanded them to do. Therefore, you have made all this calamity come upon them. Behold, the siege ramps have reached the city to take it, and the city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans who fight against it because of the sword, the famine, and the pestilence. And what you have spoken has come to pass, and behold, you see it. You have said to me, O Lord God, Buy for yourself the field with money, and call in witnesses, although the city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. Hmm. Listen to this. While Jeremiah is locked up in the prison house, he's crying unto God. And you see, when God told him again in Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3 to call unto me and I will answer you, it wasn't because Jeremiah had not been praying. It's because Jeremiah had been praying. It's God saying to Jeremiah, I heard the prayer that you made in chapter 32. Keep on praying like that. Hold fast. Hold steady. Don't give up. Keep pressing on. Keep calling unto me. And I will answer. Notice the certainty of those words. When we were reading 33 verses 1 through 16, I don't know if you noticed this, but there are numerous times over and over and over again where God says, I will. Not maybe I will, not perhaps I will, not I'll think about it. Just plain. I will. The 33rd chapter, the 3rd verse, I will answer. I will tell you great and mighty things. Down to the 6th verse, I will bring it to health and healing. The 7th verse, I will restore the fortunes of Israel. The 8th verse, I will cleanse them of all their iniquity. And these are only some of the I wills that are contained in this passage. So you know what that tells us? When God says in His Word that He wants to show us great and mighty things and do 
great and mighty thing in our lives, you can take it to the bank. You can be rest assured about it. God wants to show you great and mighty things. Look at the great and mighty things that he wanted to show or that he promised to do for the nation of Israel. He says here, first of all, in verses 1 through 7, that yes, even though the Chaldeans, also known as the Babylonians, even though they were going to lay waste to that city, there was going to come a time when it will be rebuilt, when it will be restored. And that rebuilding and that restoring is in answer to the prayer of Jeremiah that we just read in chapter 32. Look at some of the things that it says in verses 1 through 7. Particularly in verse 6. Look at this. I will bring to it health. I will reveal to them, look at this, an abundance of peace and truth. That word that's translated peace there is the word shalom. Perhaps you, you, you've heard that word. It's a, it's a Hebrew word, and it means peace. Uh, commonly today, when you see uh, Hebrew-speaking people uh, approaching one another, they will say to each other, shalom aleichem. Peace be unto you. But that word means so much more than just peace alone. It means wholeness. It means something that had been broken into pieces is going to be put back together again. The city of Jerusalem was about to be smashed to pieces by the Babylonian army. But God says here, one day again, I'm going to give it peace. I'm going to put it back together. That which was smashed, that which was scattered and broken up and sent into all directions. I'm going to put it back together again. And you know what? In 1948, when the nation of Israel was reestablished, that's when God began to do that work as far as that nation was concerned. God says here, listen to this, all the things that are smashed up in your life, all the things that have been ruined, that have been trashed, that have been separated, God says here, listen to this, shall all I want peace for you. I want wholeness, healing, restoration for you. He says here, look at this. I'm going to give you, it says, peace and truth. That word truth there is also significant. You see, King Zedekiah, in his wickedness, had led the people in rebellion against God. He led the people in following after lies. He led the people in following after deceptions and false things and false gods. But here God says there's going to come a day when I'm going to bring them all back into my truth. And you see here, those words, peace and truth, go hand in hand. You cannot separate them. You know why? They only come through one person and one person alone. The one of whom the word of God says he is the prince of peace. The one who spoke the words, I am the way, 
the truth and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. You see, the Jewish people, we're going to see this pointed out even more in verses 15 and 16, could only have peace and safety and restoration and security and truth through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the same is true for you and me. We cannot find peace and truth in anyone else. We cannot find peace and truth anywhere else. They are only found in Him and in Him alone. And so in verses 1 through 7, in response or in answer to the prayers of Jeremiah, God says, I'm going to rebuild Jerusalem and I'm going to restore. But he goes even further than that. Look at verse 8. He says here, I'm going to forgive their sin. All this wickedness and all this rebellion that they're doing against me right now, I'm going to forgive them. Savior and Lord, I had done a lot of wickedness, and I had a lot of evil, a lot of evil in my heart. Yet God says, I'm going to forgive you. Listen to the words again. Verse 8, I will cleanse them. Oh, isn't that a beautiful word? I will cleanse them. You know what? It's kind of like God takes you down into a spiritual bathtub, so to speak. Maybe some of you have had children. And when they were babies, you can recall the times when maybe, maybe you put them up in the, in the kitchen sink, you know, and you, and you wash them. I remember, uh, you know, my mother, I know she told me she used to do that for me. Put me up in the kitchen sink, you know, and she'd get a washcloth and some soap. She would wash me. She would wash my brother. She would wash my sister. Look at this. God says, you know, one day I'm going to pick you up just like that little baby that we really all are. And I'm going to wash away all the sins. I'm going to cleanse you from your iniquities. I'm going to pardon you. And we know that that only comes through that spiritual soul which is known as the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, as it tells us in, in His Word, that it's His blood that cleanses us. There, that word used again in First John. His blood cleanses us from all sin. So God, first of all, says, in answer to Jeremiah's prayer, I'm going to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. Secondly, in answer to Jeremiah's prayer, he says, I'm going to cleanse and pardon all their iniquity. And then look at this. All of this restoration and all of this healing and all of this forgiveness, you know what it's going to do? It's going to give glory to God. Look at verse 9. It will breathe be to me a name of joy, praise, and glory. That is the name of the city of Jerusalem. Right now, God is saying to me that because of their wickedness and rebellion, that name is a shame to me. That name puts my name down. But one day, God says, that name is going to be a joy to me. It's going to give me glory and it's going to give me honor and it's going to give me praise and so much so that all the nations of the earth, he said, are going to look at the city of Jerusalem and be inspired by it. They're going to be moved by it. 
to turn maybe to the Lord God themselves. Isn't that what he's doing in your life and in my life also? Where maybe at one time we had been a reproach to the things of God by the way we were living in our rebellion against Christ. But that now that we have turned to the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what? He joys in our name. He glories in who we are and what He has made us to be. He glories in how He has restored us and rebuilt us and forgiven us and made us into the children of God that we are by the shed blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. And let's hope that others can look at us now and see Jesus Christ in you and in me. As he says, you know what? So we were not meant to be lights that were hidden under a bush, but rather that we were meant to shine forth. That's what God wants you to do. That's what God wants me to do. He wants us to shine forth with his glory. So the third thing that's an answer to Jeremiah's prayer is that all this healing and restoration will give God glory. There are three more things which we'll touch on briefly. First of all, look at this. According to verses 10 through 14, the country again will abound with joy and plenty. This thing, this nation, which had been laid waste, which had been, which had been totally devastated and destroyed, one day again it's going to abound with joy and peace and happiness and prosperity. Don't we want to see that for our country? Mm -hmm. We see our country and, and it's just spiritually just sliding down. Morally it's just sliding down. But you know what? Many times we see that also in our own personal lives. That our own personal lives just sliding down spiritually, morally sliding down but God, in answer to Jeremiah's prayer, says here in verses 10 through 14 that even though you look at the city now and you see it's lying desolate and you see all the waste and you see all the destruction, verse 11, one day you're going to hear, look, look at this, the voice of joy and the voice of gladness. Let me ask you this. Do you have the voice of joy and the voice of gladness in your own life right now? That's what Jesus Christ has come to bring us. Eternal joy. Eternal gladness. The voice of joy and the voice of gladness. The voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. The voice of those who say, give thanks to the Lord of hosts. For the Lord is good. For his loving kindness is everlasting. Let me tell you something. With all the devastation that the Babylonians were unleashing upon the city of Jerusalem, as Jeremiah spoke the words of this prophecy, not a whole lot of people were giving the Lord thanks. Not a whole lot of people were feeling joyful. Not a whole lot of people were feeling glad. But God is saying here that one day it's going to happen. And it's all in response to the fact that Jeremiah did, as the Lord said, he did call upon the Lord. And the Lord did answer him, or will answer him. And the Lord will show great and mighty things in answer to Jeremiah's prayer. The ultimate experience of all this restoration, and all this peace, and all of this joy, Come when the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, returns to this earth. See, here's the good thing. He's coming back, folks. He didn't just come the first time around. He's also coming again. The Word of God predicts that over and over and over again. I think it's in the, in the book of Acts where it talks about the same way that you saw him ascending into the heavens, he's going to be coming back down. 
The Bible talks about one day the trumpet shall resound and the Lord shall descend and the dead in Christ shall rise up first. Then we who are alive will be called up to meet him in the air. He's coming back again. Look at what it says about that second coming beginning in the 15th verse. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth. Did you catch that word righteousness? At the time that Jeremiah spoke these words, at the time that Jeremiah was praying in the prison house, all sorts of wickedness was going on. Zedekiah was a wicked king. He was evil and he was leading his people in evil. And there was all sorts of injustice and all sorts of corruption going on. The 32nd chapter recalled a, a case where Zedekiah had allegedly proclaimed liberty for all of the Jewish slaves. Some Jewish people had enslaved other Jewish people. Zedekiah proclaimed the liberty for all the slaves and then went back on his word and all the slave owners enslaved them, those same people all over again. That's wickedness. That's evil. And that's what was filling up the land at this time. And yet it says here that one day God is going to be is going to raise up a righteous branch. You see all the evil that's going on today. You experience some of that evil. Some of that evil has been perpetrated and inflicted upon you. One day, it's all going to be done. Scripture says, you know what? That Jesus Christ, when he comes back to to rule on this earth, he's going to rule with a rod of iron. That means that the moment any evil seems to crop itself up just a little bit, it's going to be beat back down. The righteous branch out of David, he says here, it's going to come forth and he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell in safety and this is the name by which she will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Look at this. One day, they're not dwelling in safety right now. They're being slaughtered by the Babylonian army. One of the verses that we just read stated that their dead bodies, their corpses were piling up. And then it was because of the Lord's wrath upon them. And it was because of his anger. He was using the Babylonian army as a tool of his judgment against the nation of Judah for their wickedness. But one day all oh, that's going to come they're going to dwell in peace. And they're going to dwell in safety. And they're going to dwell in prosperity as the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and reigns with Jerusalem as his capital city. Now here's the thing. Even today, the Lord Jesus Christ wants to give you and wants to give me that same peace and that same prosperity. The only question is this, does he rule in your heart and in my heart? Is he really your Lord? As we cried out before, were you able to cry out in truth, O oh Lord, our Lord? Or were those words that you just read from the page? Hopefully, they came from your heart and from my heart. But we acknowledge.
here is the one who rules over our lives. Folks, as we seek the Lord in prayer, He will show you and He will show us. And I believe it's going to happen tonight at the bridge. Great and mighty things, which verse 3 says at the end, we don't need. Father, Lord, thank you for this great promise that we have in your word. You tell us just simply call upon you. It's not something complicated, not something, you know, that's too difficult for us to do. You just say call. And you tell us here that you would show us the powerful, powerful things. And so God, we're calling upon you right now. And I'm asking you to do great and mighty things in Brother Barry's life, oh God. And I'm asking you to do great and mighty things in Sister Trina's life, oh God. And do great and mighty things in Israel's life and in my life, oh God. Do your will in our lives. God, we're asking you to do great and mighty things at the bridge tonight. We're asking God to do great and mighty things in the lives of the people whose names we read a little while ago. God, we're asking you to do great and mighty things in this church. And it's all for your glory. And it's all for your honor. We want you to receive all the glory and all the honor and all the praise as you build up this church and as you make it into the church that you want it to be. As you build it up numerically and as you build it up spiritually, we want you to receive all the credit for it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.